The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we intend to ask and answer one of many classical questions posed by atheists, secular humanists, the world, and sadly by many who should know better but have perhaps never done their theological or historical homework. After answering our question and completing the accompanying discussion and study, our goal is to come away with a better understanding of God's nature as well as our relationship to Him. In this episode, I intend to answer a question inevitably asked of Christians by skeptics and atheists. Namely, if God is a God of love, Then how could God order the killing of every Canaanite man, woman, and child? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would, by your grace, allow us to humble ourselves, so that as we quiet our hearts, the soul of our spirits might be prepared for your seed of faith. I pray that you would help us to put aside any pride, arrogance, vanity, or conceit of our own knowledge so that we might hear your voice and understand your word to us. We ask and give thanks for all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Throughout history, there are any number of questions which exist which are and have been posed time and time again about God and His actions as recorded in the Bible. Typically, these questions are asked by atheists, secular humanists, doubters, and the like, 
of those who hold faith and reliability in the trustworthiness of Scripture. While some of these questions may, in fact, be genuine, it is my belief that more often than not, these questions are intended to create doubt, distrust, and confusion. Other times, the questions are posed as merely as a gotcha jab to ridicule the believer or their position based on what atheists and the world think are clear examples of the Bible's errancy or hypocrisy. Now, before we begin, it is important to note that characteristically, the stereotypical questions being asked almost always take the tone, if not the actual quote, of either, quote, if God, fill in the blank, then why, fill in the blank, unquote, or, quote, how could a God who is, fill in the blank, do or allow, fill in the blank, unquote, Typically, the person asking the question will fill in the first blank in either case with terms like, quote, love, good, mercy, holy, etc., unquote. The second fill in the blank in either case is usually occupied with one or more events recorded in scripture which are often out of context or misunderstood. These terms combined with the words, quote, if God, unquote, prefacing them, immediately reveal that the person asking has an assumed priori bias, wherein they already believe to some degree that for whatever reason, God and or the Bible are not being consistent. Further, since God or the Bible are not consistent, they are both un unreliable. Ultimately, when God or the Bible are unreliable or untrustworthy in part, then they are also assumed to be untrustworthy in the whole. Finally, once they reach the conclusion that since none of it is true, then the conclusion is that God does not exist. So, these questions then become the vehicle for straw man arguments and erroneous assumptions which always end up attempting to undermine and decimate the integrity of God's Word and of the faith of those who believe in God's Word. In the end, the intended result of the question itself bears little difference to that of a drive-by shooting in this regard, these type questions are frequently and indiscriminately thrown out with little, if any regard, to whom is affected, except to the extent that the recipients are someone perceived by the asking party to be someone whose worldview is polarized from their own. Now, arguably, there are many valid methods by which to deal with such callous behavior. One view is that to give credence and attempt to answer or discuss questions posed in insincerity is itself an ineffective and futile endeavor. The reason being that unless a question is sincere, the person asking will likely never be receptive to hearing or learning no matter how persuasive the argument or facts. Such people are not interested in open dialogue, much less an open mind. They are not truly interested in discussion. Rather, they ask the question simply to taunt or belittle the believer, as well as to create doubt and insecurity. However, there are those occasions when time and opportunity present themselves when the discussion and answering of such questions are not only beneficial, but necessary. One might even say that under the right conditions, 
Such apologetics are the believer's mandate, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, which says, quote, But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, unquote. To this end, let God's word serve as a lamp in this study, whereby we might, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, quote, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, unquote. So having set the stage, let's look at the first question taken from the Skeptics Encyclopedia of Supposed Bible Contradictions. Quote, if God is a God of love, then how could God order the killing of every Canaanite man, woman, and child? Unquote. Now, before we begin in earnest, I want to give listeners a disclaimer. While I am not trying to shock or offend anyone with this presentation, I am attempting to be historically accurate and candid in answering this question. In doing so, it will be necessary to present information which may be disturbing in some part to some. As such, this study requires a certain level of maturity as we proceed forward. Having said this, let's start and set a complete context. Beginning in the first chapter of Deuteronomy, God addresses Israel through Moses. Prior to this, Moses and Israel had spent 40 years wandering in the desert as a consequence of disobedience and disbelief. Now, God was preparing Israel and their future leader, Joshua, to cross the Jordan and claim the lands which God had promised them as theirs. Over the next 34 chapters of Deuteronomy, Moses delivers a series of God's laws and ordinances. He chronicles some of Israel's history as he gives God's blessings, warnings, and admonitions. In chapter 20, Moses gives Israel God's rules of engagement in preparation for war and their taking of the lands promised to them. Finally, we read Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 18, from which the skeptic gets the question posed. Quote, when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it, and it shall be, if it make thee answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, and the little ones, and the cattle, and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, thou shalt take unto thyself. And thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, from which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. But of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, 
as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that they shall teach you not to do after all their abominations which they have done unto their gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God." Unquote. Now, without making any commentary or in-depth analysis as yet, the instructions given by God through Moses are divided into two halves. The first half has to do with those cities and their inhabitants who are very far off from Israel and its land of inheritance. In this case, Israel is admonished to attempt to proclaim peace to the inhabitants. If they accept, then the city's inhabitants would live and pay tribute to Israel while serving them. If they refused, then Israel would attack and kill all males while preserving the women, children, and cattle for spoil. The second half of the admonition dealt with those cities and their inhabitants who were directly in the areas to be inherited and inhabited by Israel. Finally, the last verse gives God's summary explanation for the directive. As we begin to answer the question, quote, If God is a God of love, then how could God order the killing of every Canaanite man, woman, and child? Unquote? Let's also clearly understand what the mindset of the atheist is. In his book, The God Delusion, atheist Richard Dawkins gives his opinion of God as he sees him in the Old Testament. Dawkins says, quote, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully, unquote. Having read this charitable and open-minded opinion, we have now fully set the stage for the argument. So let's undertake to answer the question posed. On our journey to answer the question, there are 15 issues which emerge from this question which bear scrutiny. Number one, the first issue deals with intellectual sincerity. To begin with, as predicted, the tone and content of the question reveal the fact that the one asking the question has to some degree a priori bias, or they are minimally speculating and drawing conclusions based upon their own assumptions. With the above quote, the writer's underlying disdain and dislike for God and his word are clearly revealed. It is blatantly obvious that the writer does not trust God or his word. The sentiments voiced are also shared by many others who ask this and similar questions. This being said, my initial question in return is to ask, if you have come to the conclusion, or you assume that God or his word are untrustworthy, then how do you know that the information from God's word, which you are so upset about, is trustworthy? For example, the question posed was, quote, If God is a God of love, then how could God order the killing of every Canaanite man, woman, and child? Unquote. In the first part of the question, there is the conclusion, or the assumption made that God is a God of quote-unquote love. 
In the second part of the question, there is a conclusion and assumption that God is untrustworthy based upon what the Bible records. But where do both assumptions come from? If you made it up or came to your own opinion, fine. But remember, it is your own personal opinion. Also, remember that if there is a God who holds ultimate authority, then our opinions have no ability to change what God creates as reality. On the other hand, if you reached your opinion that God is quote-unquote love by reading some portion of the Bible, and then alternately you reach the conclusion that God is untrustworthy by reading another portion of the Bible, then you have just disqualified your own statement by mutual contradiction and circular reasoning. In other words, you que your question assumes that God is love based upon the Bible. At the same time, you assume that God is untrustworthy based upon the Bible. However, if you believe that the Bible is untrustworthy, then how can you trust the Bible which decrees that God is love? In order to be consistent, you only have so many choices. One, we believe all of the Bible. Two, we believe none of the Bible. Three, we pick and choose according to personal agenda. By process of elimination, we see where the atheist and humanist's argument actually resides. They certainly don't believe all of the Bible. Otherwise, one, they wouldn't be an atheist, and two, they wouldn't be having unassailable, irreconcilable issues with the Bible. If they honestly believe in none of the Bible, then there would be no basis for believing that God is quote-unquote love. This leaves us with the reality that the only reason for such discussions on the part of the atheist is a personal agenda. It also reveals the insincere nature and motive of the question posed by the atheist. Uh, namely, for the most part, there is no desire to have an honest, respectful exchange of intellectual ideas. Rather, the idea is to present a summary of pejorative terms and rhetoric cloaked in an insincere question designed to mock and ridicule God, His Word, and anyone who would choose to believe in them. But in the end, the tone, insincerity, and intellectual self-contradictory nature of the question itself demonstrates at the outset the vacuous basis of the question. 2. The second issue is one of intellectual honesty. At the outset, most atheists and secular humanists avidly disbelieve and or disavow any existence of God. If there is a supreme force in the universe, it is typically a force without consciousness or any notion of having ultimate authority. No matter what, it is not and will never be the God of the Bible. Instead, the atheist and secular humanists believe that evolution natural selection and random chance occurring over vast amounts of time are responsible for the existence of all things. Yet, knowing and being fully convinced of such things, they deign to expend large amounts of time and resources disproving or simply mocking things they disbelieve. The question is then, why do they bother to read the Bible? Having read and now being fully convinced of the Bible as a work of quote-unquote fiction, 
then why give any credence to the stories they're in? Where in this case, a God who doesn't exist tells a person, i.e. Moses, who is mythological, to do something that never happened to someone who never existed. The answer is that the atheist and secular humanist have an agenda. Their approach, like that of Satan, is to firstly create doubt by quoting what God has said out of context. Then they use their own out-of-context straw man argument to suggest that the Bible is a work of fiction and God does not exist. In rebuttal, most atheists and secular humanists would likely have us believe that their efforts are nobly targeted at gradually educating the duped masses and freeing them from the perceived shackles of religion and the myth of God. Once we do this, it is their belief that mankind at large will at long last be at liberty to reach its full potential, free of ignorance, free of superstition and all the evils that befall us. The only problem is that the atheist and secular humanist theory is defective on three points. One, if it were not for the Bible, which reveals the greatest of all historical acts that God gave his own son, Jesus, because of his love for those who are called out to represent and believe in his son, then the world, including the atheist, would have nothing to compare with when they ask the question about God's love. Thus, we must have and we need God's example of love demonstrated by Christ as articulated in the Bible in order for them to complain about God's perceived lack of love in other instances. 2. If it were not for God's word, the Bible we would not have the same Judeo-Christian values which freely allow so many to imagine themselves as superior in pronouncing condemnation on the God who ordained them, the Bible which recorded them, and the people who faithfully maintain them. In short, the atheist's ability to have and enjoy the moral laws they do owes its gratitude to God and the Bible which proclaim them, despite the fact they are the same people who complain about and disdain them. 3. If we at long last hypothetically concede to evolution, natural selection, survival of the fittest, and random choice being the engine of a godless creation, then the explanation and answer to our episode question is worse off than it is with God in control. To demonstrate the dilemma, let's flip the question around and ask it this way. Quote, If evolution and random chance are true and there is no God, then isn't what happened to the Canaanites the logical example of natural selection in action? Unquote. If so, we shouldn't blame or become angry with an imaginary God, nor should we be angry with the Israelites. If we are going to be angry, be angry with the evolutionary process. Moreover, why be angry at all? Why not rejoice at a quintessential example of the supposed beauty of natural selection and survival of the fittest? Instead, the atheist who is fully invested in evolution spends time fuming anger at a god who they see as mythical while pretending that a God who does not exist is responsible but because of his unloving nature. All the time they forget that if God does not exist, 
then the only thing to blame that's left is their beloved theory of evolution. Under the umbrella of evolution, the example of the Canaanites is really nothing more than one set of randomly evolved protoplasm acting out the natural order of survival of, of the fittest against another set of randomly evolved protoplasm. In this case, evolution would provide no meaning, morals, or ethics to it. It is only cause and effect. It is only if we consider one or both groups as a special act of God created with purpose and meaning that an act of killing then becomes problematic. Number three. The third issue for the atheist and secular humanists is one of hypocrisy. From the outset, the atheist and secular humanist argue and declare that God, the Bible, and anyone who believe in the two are unfair, unloving, unkind, barbaric, bloodthirsty, and murderous. They accuse and convict God of being immoral in comparison to the standards of today's nobler, kinder, and gentler morality and sensibilities. In particular, the atheist is offended that a loving God ordered the killing of innocent children. Yet, while the atheist and secular humanists are busy prosecuting God, it is largely the same atheists and secular humanists who proudly, confidently, and triumphantly, routinely support the systematic killing of many millions of children via abortion. Worse yet, the slaughter of these children by a majority are not issues of survival of one versus the other, Instead, they are labeled as mere issues of choice and convenience. This is hypocrisy and dilemma of the highest level for the atheist. On the one hand, they blame and curse God for his perceived lack of morality and love since he kills people indiscriminately. On the other hand, the same atheists who see themselves as having risen above such evil go on to commit horrors many multiple times worse and then congratulate themselves for being the sophisticated, erudite, elite philanthropists among humanity. But in fact, this is the logical consequence of the atheist paradigm. Once you have constructed a universe where everything and everyone is a random chance accident produced from base chemicals combined indiscriminately over millions or billions of years of evolution, then there is no longer any basis by which we can simultaneously hold any human to be anything exceptional. This may explain why, in part, that 50 years after having removed God, prayer, the Bible, and the Ten Commandments from America's schools of education, we now have the resulting fruit of this act evidenced by ever-increasing school violence, shootings, drugs, and the like. It explains why abortion, euthanasia, murder, lawlessness, and violence against others are no big deal in many people's minds. The only time when any of these issues breathe moral life is when we live and believe in the ultimate authority of God who judges every man according to God's law. Number four. The fourth issue for the atheist and secular humanists is that of ultimate authority. When the atheist and secular humanist asks the question, quote, if God is a God of love, 
then how could God order the killing of every Canaanite man, woman, and child? Unquote. It is not very long before they arrive at the appointed conclusion given by Dawkins. But the immediate question is, what authority do they use to decide they are right and God is wrong? The answer is, they use their own. Okay, we have your opinion, but does one man's opinion dictate reality? Is one man an authority of all? Well, the atheist will respond by saying, no, of course not. But we as atheists, along with the secular humanists and others, have a consensus on the matter. In fact, we have a 51% majority agreement on the issue. Better yet, we have a 100% agreement. Okay, fine. Let's ask. If I can somehow get 100% of the world's population to agree to call what is in reality white black... Does that, in fact, change a white object into a black object? No. All it does is to change the agreed-upon labels. It does nothing to change the intrinsic nature of the object and the truth of the matter. What our little example actually points out is this. Throughout history, absent God, there is no ultimate authority. There is only relative subjective opinion, consensus, and percentage based upon the culture, the environment, and other factors, all of which are in flux, subject to change. The notion of immutable truth and reality of an ultimate authority, as well as meaning, morals, beauty, only have tangible existence so long as there is an ultimate authority giver, God. Without God, who creates and sustains his own ultimate authority, we are left with man's opinion and consensus. If this is the case, mankind can take a populist vote day to day to determine whether the issue of the Canaanites or any other issue throughout time was good bad or indifferent. In the end, any one of the three options are equally valid on any given day because there is no benchmark by which to judge definitively. It is only when we recognize God as being an ultimate authority, sovereign over all, in control over all, that we next realize that it is he who dictates what is in reality good, bad, or indifferent throughout all creation. Our position and responsibility as his creation, then, is simply to adopt, submit to, and obey his authority, or to rebel against it. This concludes this episode. Please join me for part two. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I would encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. The world falls around me, I rest, I know that he has my